Welcome to Tango.vc. I'm Ivan Kiergan, and today I bring you an interview with Trevor Blackwell, who's the co-founder of Y Combinator and the robotics startup AnyBots. It's a really fun interview. We cover legs versus wheels, what it takes to win in self-driving, the most important thing when building a hardware startup, and also the kinds of startups he would like to see apply to Y Combinator. So without further ado, I bring you Trevor Blackwell. All right, today I'm joined by Trevor Blackwell, one of the co-founders of Y Combinator and the founder of AnyBots. Thank you so much for taking the time, Trevor. My pleasure. So today I was hoping to dive in into something near and dear to both of our hearts on the robotic side. And you have a few vantage points here. So you, you are a roboticist, like a very technical founder of a robotics company. And also as an investor, you've, uh, through Y Combinator, backed probably a few dozen robotics companies at this point and seen different stages of development. And so there's a lot of different interesting angles on that that I, I would love to, to try to, to peck at to try to understand the problem space. Um, and so I would love to start by going back to AnyBots. Um, that was founded in uh, early 2000s, is that right? Yeah, 2001 even. Uh, I, I had been at Yahoo for a few years and I left left Yahoo on a Friday and I started AnyBots on Monday. Uh, in, in retrospect, I should have taken a couple months and you know, hung out by the pool or something before uh, getting back into full-time foundership. <laughs> Were you just interested in robotics and you thought this telepresence, you know, we want to, we want to build robots that are like people or well, what was the thesis at the start and, and how did that evolve? You know, I wasn't thinking about telepresence much at the beginning. I was thinking, let's, let's build autonomous robots. Um, uh, and you know, that's really hard. Um, yeah. but, 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 uh, but, sort of teleoperated is a good um, stepping stone to it. It at least gives you, you know, lets you build something that you can see working. You can s make sure the hardware is capable of doing the thing you want to do with, you know, with a human controlling it. Um, and so, so that's a logical first step um, toward building a, an, you know, a, an autonomous robot. Um, so I built these, uh, these uh, teleoperated robots um, and uh, actually found it was pretty useful sometimes, uh, you know, being able to remote into the office and drive a robot around and pester people instead of trying to get them on Skype. Um, yeah, it's interesting time. I mean, right now it's uh, late May and uh, a lot of people have been in lockdown. And so the, the, the office is depopulated. And so the time where you expect a lot of people to be remote, there's nowhere to remote into. And so you're seeing just a lot, a lot of video right. calls. Um, but the idea of some remote presence is now is going to be like permanently on top of everyone's mind. And so it'll be interesting to see how this evolves over time, because there are some cases where, you know, a phone call is telepresence, right? Where you can talk to someone remotely and you're not there. Um, there's also a case where you want to be around where a bunch of other people are. And I think that that use case of uh, like a mobile eye, not just one, you know, coupled to my laptop here still makes a lot of sense. There's so many things you need to solve, though, to get that working really well. Um, I want to ask about the sort of the form factor of the mobility, because you've worked on both uh, wheeled robots and legged robots. And one of my critiques of robotics that are remote like this is that, you know, stairs are hard. And so it does make sense to go after legged robots, but it's so much harder technically to get that done. And maybe now uh, we're sophisticated enough, but um, you've built both. And so... Part of that might have been experimenting. So can you talk through a little bit about um, the experience of building each and sort of the why behind them? Well, legs are legs are enormously hard. Um, they're uh, very failure prone. Like if any actuator fails, it's robots probably going down. Um, they're um, loud. They, uh, they, you know, rattle the floor. Mm. The people working below you will hate you. Um, I've heard this was one of the reasons why uh, the MIT Leg Lab on the fifth floor of the of the computer science building uh, always had trouble keeping their funding, um, <laughs> and um, and so it's it's basically a bad deal for for almost every case, you know, except for some very extreme, you know, exploration or firefighting scenarios. Um, so I think wheels are the way to go. Um, that, that's a practical thing to do. Um, there's this. Uh, you know, with with telepresence robots, um, you know, it, 
we figured stairs wouldn't be a, a big issue there um, because if you're actually using these things at scale, you're going to need several per office building anyway, but probably mm. several per floor um, if, if a good fraction of the people are remote. And so it makes more sense to just log into a robot that's on the right floor rather than trying to navigate it up and down stairs. Yeah, I think depending on the application, I mean, this is kind of the point where it's like you have a user that has a problem in order to solve it, you need to build a product. In order to do that, you have to understand the constraints of that problem and then fit uh, a solution to that. So if you are trying to deliver uh, Chipotle <laughs> to my house, uh, there's probably some stairs because you're going outside, you know, maybe that you need to go up and down curbs um, and uh, or maybe you go all the way and deliver to a doorstep. Um, and so as you get to the delivery use cases, you start to see more hairy outdoor unknown environments that are very tricky. Um, and you know, like not every sidewalk has a wheelchair access ramp. So it's one of these things where can you assume mm -hmm. that you have the ability to do this, or maybe you constrain the problem. Like, well, the person just has to go out, the robot's going to stay in the streets and like, this is the only place it's going to stay. Um, and you brought up military and firefighting where obviously you might have like the whole house coming down in a firefighting situation or who knows what's going on in the military as far as being able to go up and downstairs. Um, I know in my experience at iRobot with the PackBot where they, they had these flippers and then treads, um, that was in order to write the robot and also to be able to go up and down stairs. And so it was like a, in that context, a very basic requirement is you need to be able to do it. But in that case, they use these treads that, uh, as far as like noise and like the smooth design are like antithetical to what would fit in an office. So that mobility platform, okay. it like is determined by the, the product experience. Um, and so, so when you made legged robots at AnyBots, is that just an experiment? You like you wanted to go after this, or what was the, or did is that how you learned that that's not the case that you want to go after? Uh, yeah, I would say it was it was a learning experience. Um, I mean, it's a it's a sort of grand challenge problem, um, and so that was one of the reasons I thought it was a good place to start is um, that if I had a, a you know machine learning programmable system that could get, you know, two-legged walking working, uh, then it was probably good for all kinds of things. Um, so, you know, you, one of the problems with uh, robotics is there aren't any benchmarks, you know, someone can build a robot that does something and like you look at it and is that impressive? It's hard to tell, you mm. know, how much has that environment been cooked for that particular robot to, to work well in? Um, so, so, so at any rate, uh, you know, walking on two legs is at least a, a thing that enough people have tried that we kind of know how hard it is and mm. something that succeeds at that must, must, must be good for something. So, uh, in the news, you see a lot about Boston Dynamics, which I've been tracking that company for a long time. I worked with them when I was at iRobot in 2007. Uh, so they've been, it's like at least a 15, 20 year old company. Um, and um, been focusing on this mobility platform for a very, very long time. And I'd love to actually just get your read on um, Spot Mini. It's the name of the product, right? The, yeah. And it's um, it's four-legged, not two. So there's a difference there. And then also it's a developer platform, uh, which is interesting. And in that, um, well, I have I I might have some opinions on this, but I'd love to just your, your take, like how, like on technically on how that product is doing, and also the business side of this of what do you what do you predict happens with that platform? Well, technically, it's it's really impressive. Uh, you know, it seems to work really well from the videos I've seen, um, and uh, they seem to be able to to mass produce them at not ridiculous cost. Uh, so that's great. I mean, that's that's really the first thing like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, do you know how many? I have no idea what the actually... business case is. Like, why? Who who needs that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. people are like all the all the sort of videos and user stories I've seen. Like, I don't I don't really buy it. You know, and so enforcing social distancing in parks. Well, I mean, well, wheels That's work cute. fine for that. Yeah, <laughs> there's um, I saw in one of their demo videos it carrying a cinder block, and so it's like it's yeah, it can carry twenty thirty pounds I think. So as you carry one cinder block at a time, and all the truck drivers out there are like, you know, yeah. like forehead slaps <laughs> like. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, how, and who puts the center block on? Like, how does this work? Um, so actually, this touches on an interesting point, which is um, vertical versus horizontal. 
um, and actually I've seen a few different companies that are taking on very uh, difficult technical challenges. And it could be in computer vision or in natural language processing or other areas. And they are going after horizontal because um, they think there's enough of a developer ecosystem to build on that. And if you have vertical, I actually put telepresence in the vertical category, uh, especially office-based telepresence, which would be different than you know pipe inspection for oil and gas, uh, that kind of even for the exact technical use case of telepresence, you would have different robots that come from that, different capabilities. Um, and so um, I don't know if you have any system of thinking about this on when to go vertical or when to go horizontal, because you have a developer platform at the Spot Mini that is obviously incredibly capable and really, really impressive what it can do. But being a platform, they don't have to pick the vertical application, which means they, they don't need the specialization to understand what the use cases are, but then maybe those cases don't exist. So it's like, where's the market? It's really difficult to know as a startup whether that platform is there. So how do you think people should decide to go after one or the other? It's That's really hard. Um, the problem with going vertical, of course, is that you need to have this enormous range of, of capabilities within your company from mm. the very deep technical stuff to the sort of consumer focused marketing sales. Um, that's really hard. Um, the problem with not going vertical um, is that you know you make some platform and then you sort of put it out in the world and hope someone figures something cool to do with it. Um, and you know that might happen or it might not. And then if it does happen, you have to worry about them you know shopping around for a cheaper version of that platform. Mm. Um, so it's it's hard to make the case uh, for a for a sort of horizontal platform play in, in, in robotics, it's hard to make the business case that you're going to end up with a long-term monopoly because, because it's not clear what the lock-in is. Um, you know, there yeah, are already starting to be teams. spot mini yeah. imitations in China, you know, that, that, I don't know, it looks like their videos work too. Um, hard, hard to tell. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but you know, sooner or later that technology is going to become, copied and 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 widely available and and then you know what's what do you get for having spent 15 years developing it yeah yeah i mean there's a the proof of concept that something is even possible is actually very very valuable and so in terms of imitators when you know that uh something is doable you can make the bet that your team could figure it out whereas in a lot of cases you don't even know if it's possible like um mm -hmm. you know so you saw in computer vision in the last few years, this unlocking of a huge number of capabilities so that you know a computer can reliably find a pedestrian or a cyclist in a video feed. And so every single self-driving car company knows that. And so they, they've seen these demonstrations of it. So they know, well, we could probably get the reliability up high enough that the system would work really well. Whereas if you're developing that without knowing if it's possible, now you have some other applications like, uh, let's just invent something. So can you replace a car dealer at a casino with a robot That's well. I'm not sure yeah. I've ever seen a robot successfully shuffle a deck of cards. That actually sounds pretty hard. Of course, there's the automatic shufflers, but it's like hands and dealing. That sounds maybe a dedicated hardware could do it. But, you know, it's one of these things where like, I don't, I don't know if that specific possibility is, is the capability is possible. And so um, there's a lot of risk in doing it. But once that's demonstrated, then the competitor at competitive landscape gets much more dangerous for others to do just the, if you're building the platform to be able to replicate just that platform capability. What do you think would have happened to Cruz had they not been acquired? Um, it's it's so hard to know. Um, you know, I, I'd like to think they would move a little faster, uh, but had, you know, it. I'm sure they get some benefit from GM and being able to integrate really deeply with, with the car. Because um, a lot of the early systems were basically just retrofits on the cars. I mean, yeah, Cruz's yeah. first thing, they had this giant actuator, you know, pushing the brake pedal and clamped onto the steering wheel and there's like duct tape everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, so if, even if you had perfect software that could identify every other car perfectly and, you know, there's still a lot of things that can go wrong with that car. Mm -hmm. Um, so to get to the level of reliability that you need, which is, you know, a, a few crashes per billion miles, that, that's an extremely high level of reliability. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you have to, think through all these things that happen like you know certainly you got to deal with tire failures you got to deal with the engine shutting down i mean there's, there's yeah. hundreds of things that can go wrong over a billion miles uh and the the software's got to do something 
not catastrophic in all those cases. Um, so I, th I think ultimately, you know, self-driving does have to be integrated with a vehicle company. You, you can't just bolt it on. Yeah, it's so, interesting. So ultimately, I, th I think they did the right thing, but uh, I, maybe I wish they'd stayed independent a little longer. Yeah, you could say the uh, the need for a large amount of cash to do the deep integration that they need, uh, that that's inevitable. So that could have been, you stay independent and raise $5 billion from SoftBank or something, and um, uh, then you could have seen the development that way. Um, it's also interesting in terms of... I think it's of... many, many billions. I mean, if you're talking yeah. about, if you're talking about being able to claim that you've only, you only have a few accidents per billion miles, you've got to drive several billion miles, you know, on the last iteration of the software, you know, because yeah. the ones before that don't count. Um, and uh, so that's a lot of, a lot of billions of miles by the time you've, you've really proven it. Um, and, uh, you know, miles cost... 50 cents, according to the IRS, um, you know, probably, it's probably what they cost if you're running a fleet. Um, so yeah, some uh, experience looking at those numbers, it's billion, uh, many billions of dollars. Yeah, it's it's very, very expensive. And um, my intuition is that actually both Waymo and GM are fairly conservative, and probably could have launched in a limited area. I mean, when you talk about launch, it's always more nuanced than that. It's not, it's like, is it daytime, nighttime, good weather, bad weather, like San Francisco versus the peninsula. These are all very different areas where you want to launch. You know, Phoenix has lanes that allow you to stay in your lane in a way that just San Francisco yeah. doesn't uh, in terms of construction sites and cyclists and narrow roads, parked cars, double parked cars. Uh, it's so much more aggressive than where you need to go. Um, and so it was such a power move for Cruz testing in San Francisco. I mean, that's the that will be the one of the hardest places in America anyway. Yeah, I mean, they, they've written about this and I, I love it. Uh, the idea that uh, if you're driving a mile, because uh, miles are expensive and they're relatively equally expensive in any area. So if you're going to go out to Phoenix mm -hmm. or in the, you know, in the middle of nowhere, freeway driving um, or uh, San Francisco, you want that marginal mile to have a faster learning rate where you encounter more weird things. And so, you know, San Francisco is full of weirdos, but it's also full of uh, really weird driving scenarios. Like, you know, the muni is above yeah. ground. You have all these cyclists, pedestrians, of course. It's, it's a very difficult environment. Um, and so the the thinking, which I think is very correct, is well, if they test there, then they uh, they're going to make f faster progress. Um, and so I do wonder if you were to put their vehicles in the areas where Waymo has been, how the relative performance would be, because they're almost not, you know, you don't get to see the side by side comparison because they're operating in different cities. Um, so it's, to your point before, it's like who's ahead? Like it's kind of hard to tell. Like what is the benchmark here? You know, because mm -hmm. the stats get pretty complicated pretty fast. You know, the, the main benchmark you hear about is accident rate, um, but uh, and or disconnect rate at any rate. Um, but you don't uh, you don't hear about how nice it is to drive in them. Um, and at least the rumors I heard from the early Waymo experience was that it was really annoying to drive in it because it went you know exactly the speed limit and stopped fully at every stop sign, and it was like being with the most timid driver ever. Yeah. Um, Hopefully, you don't have to pay attention to the driving. Uh, that's another dimension I've heard where <laughs> right. it's super interesting at the start and eventually in a, in a good way, it gets boring or like, yeah. you know, I'm, i I trust the machines and you know, slowly like a, some, you know, a geriatric driver, like just, you know, gingerly driving along. It's exactly what you want of the robot to be super boring. Like you mm -hmm. don't have to pay attention to it. And so that, that experience, I mean, I've told this to my wife who is uh, very reticent to do anything in self-driving she like turns off all the autonomy of our cars like doesn't like any of it um and what i was trying to explain to her is like yeah once it's risky if you don't trust it that's a super nervous situation like you don't know what's going to happen but then if it gets to the point where everyone trusts it that'll be a totally different psychology when you're in it uh when you when you do look at the accident rate and you're in it for a while and it seems normal then you just stop thinking about it and so it's really hard to predict the like the user reaction to the uh, autonomy because if you look at it, autonomy today and just project that out, it's like, that's not accurate because, you know, you stop too fast or go too slowly or too, mm -hmm. you know, not aggressively enough on some unprotected left turn. Um, but if you have, uh, if you, you need to predict what the experience would be like after it's better and able to launch, which is going to be boring. And, and you got to figure out who the early adopters are. Like, uh, even though I'm an early adopter of tech generally, um, 
like I'm a pretty good driver and I have a Model S and it's kind of fun to drive. Uh, so I, I don't I don't need it. Um, but you know, people who've uh, are too young to drive, who've lost their license. Uh, who have some disability that makes it very hard to drive. There's a few different companies here. One of them that just reminded me is Voyage. So they're operating in a retirement community. And that means that you have people that do struggle with mobility generally. Um, and it's a mm -hmm. relatively constrained environment. So it's touching on a few points here because it's uh, an easier environment, which means you could launch faster. It's a very hungry community for this kind of mobility. And then they can scale with that to more aggressive areas. So it's interesting seeing these different companies like Waymo, Generalist in a relatively easy area, Voyage, kind of narrow area in an area they could launch fast, and then Cruise just going as hard as they can for the hardest area because they think the general case matters mm -hmm. a lot. So it's not the first city, it's the, the speed to your 20th or 30th city. When it comes to self-driving, and this is true for other areas, perception works pretty well. The computer vision is now very capable. And so you can identify things really, really well. So you know, here's a pedestrian, there's a cyclist. Um, but when it comes to the behavioral planning, it's a lot of rules. And that means it's like brittle in terms of how things are moving around. And this is true for manipulation as well, where you might be able to detect the object in his pose, but then deciding how to pick it up is often a lot of rules or needs a lot of constraints to make that work well. Um, and so what do you think is going to happen there? I mean, like there's the Tesla end-to-end -end self-driving with behavioral planning baked into that one neural net. But then Waymo and Cruise, in my understanding, are both very rules-based. So when it comes to, for example, your example before yeah. of how fast something slows down, that is, it's governed by a magic number in the code that then they could tune to make it more human. But there's still that bit of code that says, here's the rule on how you approach a stop line and how you should mm -hmm. stop it. Um, and so what's your take on this sort of more difficult behavioral planning problem in the autonomy side? Um, I, th I think that's one of the great questions about robotics generally is how do you, I mean, how do you get the right behavior? Um, do you, um, I mean, you can, you can try to program it explicitly with, you know, feedback loops and in, in code, um, or you can try and use some kind of learning, uh, but in the learning, there has to be a, a you know, a reward function or, you know, some kind of, there's, you, 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 you have to specify what you want in some other way. Um, and, and for something like, you know, how to approach a stop sign, it's not just like, did you cause an accident or not? You know, there's lots of ways of doing that badly, like so badly that it'll terrify people. Um, but, but it's hard to quantify that. So I think, you know, that's an example where it's actually easier to specify, you know, sort of a, a normal behavior as, as a, you know, as a function of speed over time and distance, um, than, you know, a general reward function for how good a particular stop was. Mm. But I think there needs to be both. I mean, some things um, like vi vision problems seem to work much better to have a huge data set, a huge labeled data set and train on it, right? Um, and uh, control problems seem to work. The, the only good way we have of doing that now is to, you know, explicitly have control theory people think about how the feedback loops work you know mm. no one's gotten very good results trying to do any kind of uh tabula rasa learning for that so i wanted to ask about sort of the the timeline for development here for startups in the earliest stage because when you're there's like building an engineering prototype that something starts to work and then there's uh starting to design for manufacturability and that end use case and like the mass production and so this gets more and more expensive and you really want to make sure you have a good use case um, where you, you really understand like the product and the user experience. And so when it comes to patterns you've seen and the different kinds of companies, have you noticed anything as far as like what works well here? Because it's so expensive to develop hardware and making many of something is also expensive in other ways where you know, the manufacturability and reliability of it has to be far, far higher. But the earliest stage companies like the, the seed round uh, that a software company might have would get burned up much, much faster. The capital requirements are higher. And so maybe the answer is just raise a lot more money. Um, but then that, that's kind of begging the question because it's like, well, uh, what kind of validation do you need to be able to be able to do that? Um, and so I just want to ask in the general space of the cost 
of getting to something at higher scale and the validity you need or the validation you need to be able to raise that money? What patterns you might have seen here that you think are effective? Well, even if you magically have a lot of money, um, it's still very slow to iterate on hardware. Um, un unless you basically make that the number one priority every day is to be able to iterate. Um, you know, the, the, the best companies I've seen have been able to consistently do like a weekly iteration cycle where they change something, like they make some meaningful design change, they whip up some hardware in their lab in the back, they show it to a customer who gets to use it and they actually, and, and they get feedback. And they, you know, if you can turn the ra that around in a week, which is an amazing feat on hardware. I mean, in software, you turn that around in an afternoon. Um, but, uh, you know, if you really focus on it and you're able to turn that around in a week, um, that, that's a, that's a, that, that's, that's great. And that, that's seems pretty correlated with success. Um, that might imply so, not a consumer focus, right? In terms of just like the cost point for a consumer being far lower and the scale being far higher. And so is this, I'm just asking, is this like a thing you've seen? I think, all... No, I think you can do it on consumer stuff too. You just have to have some captive consumers. Um, I mean, you can't, you can't, it, it doesn't work to do like a Kickstarter and then ship, you know, a hundred of them all over the world randomly and hope, you know, a few of them actually get unboxed and, and played with and you get some feedback. Um, it's, uh, you, you gotta, yeah, you, you gotta have some friendly consumers who are gonna tr try out your slightly less broken thing every week. Hmm. Yeah, the iteration speed is- But especially is for industrial, you know, for, 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 uh, for, for industrial things, then yeah, you certainly need to iterate, you know, in a real setting. Hmm. That also brings up that platform versus vertical side to it, where um, I've seen some companies that are going after very broadly some manufacturing robots that have new capabilities and that might be considered a vertical, but then are they making the end product? A good example of this recently was a, a 3D printed house company that I saw. And um, you know, it might be far, far cheaper to build out the house if it's 3D printed, but then your buyer is, especially in construction, the, the very traditional in terms of how deals mm -hmm. get done, as far as you know, people meeting people, but then also relatively slow absorption of new technology. And so they, uh, the answer might be you have to go and build the houses yourself and then you can iterate very quickly on the houses that you build. Um, the answer might also be that you, know, you just have to break into that industry and sell to it. Part of what you should do in the beginning is design your business model around being able to iterate you know, the, the, the fastest you can. Um, mm. And uh, that's hard with a platform. Um, you know, maybe you can make it work, but for something like a, a 3D printed house, I think what you'd want to do is you'd want to make a house and then have someone move into it and then, you know, watch them like notice that you forgot to have a door into the kitchen or something. <laughs> and then you make the next one next, you just apologize to them and make another one next door and keep going. If you're making a platform, it's because you don't even know what the real application is, mm. you know? Something like something like Spot Mini, you know, who, who knows? You know, I, I assume they're hoping that someone will figure that out for them. If it turns out that there's some change that they need to make, you know, it would have been nice if they could have designed that in five years ago when they were, we were designing the hardware. So for YC companies that are doing hardware, um, what do you hope they get done during that three months? Because, I mean, normally if it's a SaaS company, I'm just going to uh, draw a caricature where you have some B2B SaaS and you have a certain number of leads and you want to dial up that lead source, get better at closing, excellent customer support. So you have low churn, uh, excellent product as well. And you make that number go up into the right. And then when you're fundraising, it's like a debut and it's like, look at this amazing graph. That's every everything I just said is much harder with hardware. <laughs> so uh, in robotics is yep. like an autonomy layer on top of the hardware that makes it even harder. Um, and so um, for all the hardware companies coming into YC, like how should they spend their time like what have you seen work really, really well? I mean, almost nothing works works very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, what can work is if you're going for an application like self driving, that everyone agrees. Uh, you know, if you can make that technology work, it'll be great. Um, but I think it's if you're going for an application that, you know, is just your hunch that this is something people would want. Um, 
it's very hard to prove that out, you know, before spending a few years and millions of dollars, you know, building something, you know, cheating with teleoperation, for example, um, is, is, is a good start. So if you're, if you're, product is going to be like some robot arm that does something, you know, fold someone's laundry or something like that. Um, you should build a teleoperated version and put it in someone's house and have a guy sitting, you know, in, outside in a van with the controls and fold the laundry for them um, and see if that's something people actually want. My, my guess is it probably isn't like folding laundry isn't anyone's biggest problem. Um, yeah, I think I saw but, a uh, demo from Willow Garage a few years ago where um, they debuted a robot that was, you know, that has these big shoulders and these just pinchers. Yeah. Um, and they cleaned a whole house. It was amazing. Uh, and so only at the end do you learn that was just teleoperated. But it probably took like yeah. 400 hours, right? It was actually seemed moving pretty fast. Uh, okay. And so but teleoperated was the key there. It wasn't autonomous. And I, yeah. I think their point was like, um, the platform is fine. Like, it doesn't matter that, yeah. you know, you don't have as much mobility in the shoulders or that the hands can only carry so much or that they're just pinchers, not you know, fingers, um, they're able to get everything done. Um, and mm -hmm. so that's like a, it's like a call to arms for the software folks, like the perception planning, yeah. uh, to really, you know, get it together and solve this problem. And related to that, I think an interesting corollary to your point about teleoperation is training data. So, um, going back to self-driving, uh, I'm very, uh, I mean, I'm just bullish on the industry overall, but Tesla's approach, um, means that they have these human examples, it's not teleoperated, it's uh, operated by a human in place of the autonomy uh, to get you the training data to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so I think teleoperation has that pattern where that robot folding the laundry, however much you have somebody, a human doing that, it's all data for your robot to do it eventually. And so there's this nice evolution from yeah. building the platform you could use with a human on top, you get the data and there's more and more capability about what the robot could do on its own. It's like a, a path to full autonomy. So I think a lot of things uh, like that, that's the right way to start is some kind of teleoperation or, you know, or, um, or like a, 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 a ride along system that's, that's observing a human doing it somehow. Um, and uh, the problem is it's, it's been, uh, it's rarely economically viable to do that as a business on its own. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I found that with telepresence robots that, you know, it, it, in principle, you know, you can save some labor cost by using people in lower cost areas. So you can, you can hire people in Tennessee and they can work in an office in California and maybe you've got a 50% labor savings, you know, but that's not, that's not going to pay for the whole rest of the system. You got to figure out a business model that it at least doesn't lose massive amounts of money while you're collecting all this data. And so, you know, the, the Tesla thing, I'm sure they're spending a lot on putting cameras on all these cars that people aren't, you know, that, that don't have the self-driving feature. Um, they, they have positive e it. economics on the car itself. Um, and yeah, even right. when you look at the operating cost of having data piped back to Tesla, that can't be so expensive. And you compare that to the cost of paying a driver in a car, uh, which is the alternative. Um, right. So that they're not paying the driver is the key. Um, so they have margin in the car itself and, um, there's no such margin if I were to, so you take like a lift car and add a whole bunch of expensive sensors on top of it, uh, which are going to be just capital costs out of the way and then expensive operating costs on having a fleet go day in, day out. And then also the data pro costs and everything you need to be able to do. And so Tesla's in a very good position just in the, their ability to not pay for a lot of that part, uh, to make it worthwhile. Right. It also means they don't have very expensive sensors because you know the car would have been much more expensive had it had lidar on it, and so their autonomy problem is harder because they don't have it. I actually remember seeing a video from Elon Musk talking. I think it was with Rogan, uh, maybe maybe Lex <laughs> on you know some of these awesome podcasters um, asking what the hard part is, and he said the localizing every object in your environment, like all the other cars and the bikes, that's really hard, and then the behavior is easy. And I, this to me was mm -hmm. as much as I love Tesla's approach, the, the biggest red flag uh, of their robotics capabilities because they don't have LiDAR. And so they've like structurally made it so that they don't know the exact position of where everything else is. And like that's, uh, 
it's so it's easy for everyone else that has lidar to know exactly how far and the velocity of these other vehicles it is um and everyone else in the industry thinks behavioral planning is hard where like that's the hardest part to do knowing where everything is that's relatively easy knowing what to do given where everything is that's hard um so it's a really interesting take on this because like of course when you have cameras and radar um they're able to um like it's harder for them to localize on each little bit and so I, I'm worried about their self-driving as a result of that. Um, on, on the other hand, the amount of data they're going to get is so much larger that if you're going to train the system end to end to include that behavioral planning, I, I'm confident they can get there. It's just going to require a hundred times more data. So while it might be cheaper for them to acquire, it's also going to be uh, like they need a lot more of it to make this work, which is, I think, the general consensus that these vision systems can work, but it's a lot of data required, you know, a hundred billion miles, something on the order like that. In terms of companies that you'd like to see start applying in a robotic space to YC, like some of the applications you'd like to see there, um, like is there is there any application you'd love to see? I think delivery is going to be one of the biggest ones. Um, and there's so many different kinds. Uh, you know, there's multiple kinds of drone delivery, like fixed wing and, and quadcopter are, you know, entirely different kinds of technical problems. Um, and uh, the sort of rolling food delivery robots, I think, are going to be big. Um, you know, the efficiency is there. Like if, if you can build the, the amount of money you can save by having a little thing, you know, this big moving around uh, to, to deliver food instead of a, a, a car, like a 3,000 pound car with a human in it, um, is it, the, the cost savings are so big that if you can make that work, it'll be great. Um, hmm. And you know, the, the drone delivery stuff is, is working pretty well in a few places where they don't have cost constraints, like Zipline is operating in Rwanda and doing lots and lots of deliveries. Um, and, you know, there, the alternative is like, you just can't get vehicles through at all on some of the muddy roads in, in the rainy season. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, they're delivering life-saving medical stuff, you know, that, that couldn't be delivered otherwise. So you know, they can, they can absorb the initial high operating costs. Um, so I think you got to find a place like that. So, you know, you don't want to start with delivering Big Macs, uh, by, by quadcopter, first of all, because any self-respecting dog is going to be able to get it. Um, <laughs> and, and second of all, it's just like, how, how much are you saving? Like a dollar or two. Um, uh, and so yeah, it, even it's, just logistics, I, I think the combination um... of delivery for, for high value things. Um, where, where people really value getting it fast. Uh, it goes back to your earlier point about finding a user that is uh, very interested in this solution so that they can work with you more on developing your solution. It's also really common I, in technology. I think it's always the case that for every particular, like for every broad application, like if, if your goal is to eventually be able to deliver, you know, lunch to every house in, in the country, um, you know, you still got to start with something where where the where the value is a lot higher and the tolerance for mistakes is higher. Yeah, this is true broadly in technology, I think, because you have, right. for example, plastic surgery, where people are very motivated to not look their age. And that has broad applications in other areas like, um, you know, reconstructive surgery for a burn victim or things like that. Mm -hmm. People have been in accidents um, and you have um, and it, a lot of things that are really going to be like this, including uh, some neural deficits you're trying to overcome, and that will be how we get brain interfaces into computers. Um, mm -hmm. You have these narrow applications that people care greatly about, but then the technology enables you to do so much more, more much more broadly. And so eventually then delivering the Big Mac is worth it, uh, even though the um, it wouldn't be the first thing to attack today. And so delivery, mm -hmm. it's also interesting because we get so accustomed to how good things are. And so if you think back to e-commerce 10 years ago, like how fast you expected to get something. And now if you don't get it the next day, you know, COVID aside, like a day or two seems like a long time. And I, I yeah. expect that to be true for this pattern will continue. So you'll have uh, at some point in the future, you can imagine the moment I think about something, it's in my hand or very close to that. Like it, it's wherever the closest version of that is, like it can come and be in my hand right away. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so much to do to be able to enable that because this just gets harder and harder and harder to make these systems profitable and viable, technically capable enough to be able to do it. And so I think autonomous delivery, just in terms of, you know, most commerce being in this category of a consumer says they want something and then they have it, um, 
there's there's a lot of fruit there that it makes i mean it's, it's really hard technically to be able to get every last detail working um but it's also there's a lot large prize at the other end and you know you can prototype that in one neighborhood you know maybe maybe even with human runners but you'd like to find out like how many more iPhones would people in this zip code buy if we could get them you know whatever they clicked on in 15 minutes or or maybe it's negative like maybe people buy things in advance because they know if they break their phone it'll take a long time to get a new one um, so I, I think it would be worth going and quantifying those kind of things one of the applications I think is, is exciting is in uh, auto parts. Uh, there's this thing where you put a car up on a, on a stand and you look under it and you think, uh, and you realize, oh, it needs a something or other from the warehouse. Um, and currently it takes like an hour for a courier to bring that, during which time either you've got your hoist in use for an hour or you put the car back down and bring in another car. Um, and so there's an example where if you could get something from a warehouse in five minutes, ought to be possible, you know, to get five miles in five minutes um, by air, uh, you know, it, it changes the equation dramatically. There's enough of these, there's enough of these uh, high value use cases that I think, you know, delivery can be, can, can find a big enough niche to start there. Yeah. And that requires you understand the space too. So when it comes to construction right. projects and, um, you know, different work sites where people are trying to get something done, where, you know, that example of like the bay for uh, maintaining a car, that's like a very sensitive part of the business where if you can get more cars through, then uh, the whole operation becomes that much more efficient. Um, and so uh, if, how many things are in this category where if I just had what I wanted quickly, the business would be that much more productive? I've um, mm -hmm. been thinking about this recently in a slightly different sense, just in terms of telemedicine, where um, during lockdown, uh, an appointment has to be remote. Um, but then that highlights how much time is wasted because like in terms of uh, what it takes to see a doctor um, and uh, I haven't seen this yet, but even breaking that even more to be asynchronous so that a doctor can really see all the requests that come in and then maybe a schedule call with some, but then also just have a reply. Um, like if everything needed to be in Slack, if somebody invented email, that'd be very exciting. And so today we have worse than Slack. It's like everyone needs to be in the exact same room to see your doctor. And if it can only be digitized and then asynchronous mm -hmm. where appropriate, um, there's so much more you can get done there. Um, and so, yeah, I think generally there's, there's so much more technology if you just think about the industries and how things work today uh, and um, understand those verticals and then build an application to, to meet that demand. Medical industry is hard. You know, I, I explored telepresence uh, for, for medical diagnosis and Boy, the, the regulations just make it uh, very painful. You know, there, there have been a bunch of emergency use authorizations for uh, various kinds of telemedicine uh, during the pandemic. That may help people get comfort with the, the fact that it works perfectly well, diagnose a lot of things over the phone. And, you know, because people can take their own temperature. And for a lot of it, like for infectious disease type stuff, uh, I think it's very rare that there's some complicated thing that only the doctor can do with their own fingers. Right? Yeah. You know, it's like temperature, blood tests, all, you can do all that at home. Yeah, I think it's hard to appreciate when you're outside of this how much, I mean, we were talking about iteration speed before, and if you add a regulatory burden on top of that, and it's not, it's not a burden, because if it were just like a weight to lift, I think that would be easier. It's, it's like a fog, like this fog of war, and the cost of feeling yeah. out in that space uh, lowers your iteration speed and makes it very much harder to have a successful product here. Because from the regulator's point of view, they think, oh, you know, it takes like a few years to develop a product. So if we add a, another year onto that, we're only adding like 30% or something like that. But n no, they're, it's not because it's, it's, it, it meant like originally during that three years, you could iterate a hundred times, many hundred times. Um, and now you can only iterate once over this, over this four year cycle um, with, with, you know, all the way to and and user testing mm. um, like back when people could just sell patent medicines out of their out of their you know wagon at the at the at the fair you know they could they could try new ingredients every week <laughs> certainly learned something i don't know if, i don't uh, know if that <laughs> yeah. i mean that's the hard part it's like um i mean this goes back to um automotive as another example too because um when something is so on the nose about health uh, then we become very cautious. Like this precautionary principle comes yeah. into play. It's like, well, we don't want to do any harm. Um, but everything causes harm. 
uh, tens of thousands of people die a year in car accidents. Inaction so, causes harm. Inaction causes harm. And so you're making a choice one way or the other. Um, and when you break it down, too, it's, it's incredible. So I remember discussing with some automotive friends about... So the way a brake works is they have a disc and it's squeezed by a caliper and then the car slows down, right? Like a disc brake in a car. And that caliper, you're making four per car and you make millions of cars. So you have, you know, tens of millions, uh, hundreds of millions of these devices. And so if you're a car company and you spend 10 cents more or less, that is millions of dollars more you can make or not. And so the the cost of these calipers is like a dollar to three. And the $3 caliper is far, far better at stopping. And you will stop the car faster and you will get in fewer accidents. And so uh, car companies are accustomed to this where they have an engineering question where they know the capability and they have to map that to um, something that people really, really care about, like the chance of getting an accident. And so um, there's uh, it just highlights these decisions are made constantly, uh, whether or not mm -hmm. we, uh, we are aware of them. Uh, you, have to, yeah. you have to understand, like every choice, including inaction, is, uh, which is a vote for the status quo, essentially. Like we want to keep this going for mm -hmm. longer, um, but that, that iteration keep this speed pandemic is going a long time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this whole, there's been a call to action recently. I actually would love, love to hear your take on this. So did you see the Mark Andreessen, It's Time to Build? Um, that was yeah. one of his rounds. Yeah, I mean, um, I can predict what you say, but what, what's your take on that in terms of, uh, why were we here or how to get out of this funk in terms of how fast we can uh, make progress. He's totally right. We, we haven't been building the things we need. Um, and it's embarrassing seeing, like, I, you know, I remember in the 90s when I lived in Boston and came out to San Francisco, like it felt like the future here. And now it doesn't seem like the future compared to Taipei or, or Singapore. Um, it feels kind of run down and stagnant. Um, and uh, yeah, we got to fix that. And, you know, it, like the, what's frustrating is seeing these basic things like, like building houses, you know, we figured out how to do really efficiently a long time ago. You know, that, that kind of peaked certainly by the eighties, you know, you could, you could crank out lots of housing and mm. yet we can't do it not anymore. And it's all, regulatory burden. So we need more experiments. I mean, like, it's fair enough to, to worry that, oh, if we just took away all the regulations, there'd be terrible consequences. You know, people would build shanty towns and, and buildings would fall over, and, like there would be problems. But we, we've gone way too far in the other direction. And so we've got to try some experiments of saying, well, let's, let's build a small city here and let this company just do it as they best they can figure out and see what happens and and then actually go and say look this city cost you know one tenth as much and got built 10 times faster than you know building another suburb of phoenix or someplace and and so like come on let's let's fix this yeah that's awesome um so i think we're just about out of time and we could wrap it up there so thank you so much for taking the time my pleasure I want to say thanks again to Trevor for taking the time and also to you for getting it this far in the video. If you have any questions or comments, please leave a comment below and please do subscribe to the channel. It really helps immensely. And also, if you want to hear from anyone in particular, any other person in tech that I can get a hold of and try to ask some questions, uh, please let me know in the comments or email me at ivan at tango.vc. Thank you.